Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today, we're at the Feminist Press offices right here in the CUNY Graduate Center. Why? Because we're going to be looking at the women's movement through the CUNY lens. We'll take a look at Title IX and campus sexual assault, teaching women's and gender studies, and so much more. But first... With almost 50 years of publishing under its belt, the Feminist Press recently welcomed a new leader to its ranks to carry out a mission that's more relevant now than ever. So we're 47 years old, which is admittedly older than myself. We are in one of the most controversial times in American history. All of the issues that we care about as feminists, many of the issues that we have been writing about and supporting for years around reproductive justice, economic justice and equality, et cetera, are on the headlines every single day. And so we have an opportunity right now to not only continue to share and champion books from underrepresented voices that speak to these issues and speak truth to power when necessary, but that also inspire people to act, to vote, to march, to lead in a time when we really need it. And we needed it in 1971 when the feminist press started, and we need it now more than ever. Books are capable of mobilizing masses. Books are capable of starting revolution. That's one of the reasons why I took this job. Books help me understand that there was a different way to do things than what I was being taught in school. We often share them with people that we love. We often will reference them when we're talking about the formation of our ideas. We publish nonfiction, fiction, memoirs. We have books on everything from women writing Africa to science books to books about medicine. We recognize that there are a variety of vantage points that people can have who believe in gender justice, and, and we share them for the variety of different curiosities that people have. Daddy Was a Number Runner is a beautiful book. The book itself has created its own culture around it and has inspired so many black writers, including myself. But now we have a prize that's named after Louise Merriweather. And the winners of this prize who are women or non-binary authors of color who are debut authors, like YZ Chen, who get an actual cash prize for this work to help support them in, in their writing and their voices. Before I joined the team, I came to the event where YZ accepted her award and was immediately stunned by her brilliance and humility, and as well as her courage to, to share such a powerful and poignant story. The book is uh, interconnected stories um, that are set mostly in Malaysia, and it sort of touches on the current political climate um, and the legacy from colonialism, um, and just sort of my take on how um, repressive government action can sort of lead to um, sort of suboptimal treatment of citizens. The main character of my book is a young woman who actually sort of gets sent to prison as a political dissenter because of some poems that she wrote. It sort of ties in with the press's um, mission to sort of highlight um, controversial, underrepresented voices. The Louise Merriweather Prize is a great initiative. I'm really looking forward to see the future books that come out of it. Um, I feel like I'm part of something, um, a movement to lift up um, voices that you don't really find in U.S. publishing. Everybody who works here is a feminist. That means they self-identify as people who believe in the political, cultural, economic, and social equality of people of all genders and all races. The most recent publications that we have represent the intersection of race, class, and gender. At the Feminist Press, we really champion the idea that there are multiple feminisms, that there are many different ways that people can approach looking at how we get to equality. And while we might have different theories of change, all of us agree that equality and liberation for all people is important and paramount. Publishing is an industry that is not very diverse. The people who are in leadership and publishing traditionally are white and male. What is great about being on this team is we represent 
more of a picture of what our community looks like and the diversity of who we all are. And if you don't have everyone at the table, then we can't get the full story. One of the reasons I took this job is that I really felt like this role was a role that I wanted to grow into and with. So I knew that at that time, what my gifts were in addition to the gifts of this press and the direction it was going as it was entering the 50th anniversary of the press's life, that I knew that I wanted to be a part of that. Florence Howe, our founder, who's active in our editorial meetings, still does proofreading for us and so champions and cares about this press that she built, has really inspired me to think about the long-term game as it relates to this press, but also feminist thought leadership in the world. So I'm really happy to be here and want to continue to be a part of the press's story. Teaching women's and gender studies in colleges across the country has not only changed over the decades, but has become more popular now than ever with students. One CUNY college clearly reflects the change. There's something about the current generation of college students that really sees that feminism still has a lot of work to do, and so they're less likely um, to see feminism as, as a relic of the past, which I think is really important. Feminism is certainly no relic of the past for the diverse student population of BMCC, where interest in gender and women's studies courses has been so high that in the fall of 2017, the college began offering a two-year Associate in Arts, Gender and Women's Studies program, the first of its kind in CUNY. What activities do you engage in or have you engaged in that could be considered activism? Brienne Wakeoff says that associate degrees in women's and gender studies are not usually found at two-year schools. And that's something that's growing because at two-year schools we serve the populations that need it most. Um, and so we look at gender, race, class, sexuality, all of these things are interconnected. If we look at what we've been seeing in the media recently, our president, the Me Too hashtag, all of these issues are coming up. I think what's happened is we don't have as much blatant oppression of women, um, but it's in our institutions. It's in our ways of thinking. We're concerned about certain topics like gender equality and wage gaps. While the new program at BMCC explores a wide range of women's and gender issues, Wakeoff says some institutions still teach the curriculum as a white middle to upper class movement. There's been a lot of, not as much focus on lesbians, uh, gay, bisexual, trans people, a lot of n not considering women of color. Now that's not the way it's actually been, right? In the world, women of color and the other groups I mentioned are making amazing contributions and have been, always, but they've been erased. So sort of women's studies and feminism has had to reckon with uh, the exclusions that they created in their attempts to sort of liberate women. Jamie Warren believes some of the exclusions are embedded in the very jargon academia has traditionally used in the classroom. This has prompted her to make mindful choices in the words she uses. One thing that I have found myself changing a lot, and almost to the point where it's become a somewhat of an existential dilemma for me when I teach, I can no longer say the word woman when I, or women's issues without kind of immediately feeling intellectually um, like I'm lacking in some way or even feeling a sense of political guilt because when I say the word woman I'm there's there's no sort of marker there but when I teach about say Latina women's experiences or black women's experiences I've marked these different groups with this other cat like this other descriptive term so and then if I say that term then I just say the word woman again I'm suggesting the term woman means white and which particular women are studied in a typical course also has changed Rather than studying notable women or women who have accomplished something usually associated with men's achievements, a shift in academia occurred where the focus is now on studying everyday women. Because if we only study women who add to history in men's terms, we're going to keep studying things like war, politics, 
diplomacy. When we start studying ordinary women, we start to realize that there are different chronologies, perhaps even why study war as a, as a chronological marker? Why not study disease patterns or birth rate patterns, right? Like the social experience of the everyday can come to shape categories of thought. I think I might also say in the last couple of years with the current, you know, the, after the ele leading up to and after the election, um, my teaching has become a little bit more radical. I'm a little less apologetic about a radically feminist stance in the classroom. I feel it's necessary at this point in history. From the time that women's and gender studies was just getting started as an area of academic inquiry in the 1960s to this point in history, where a teacher sees the need for a stronger feminist stance, Warren has no doubt that the field will be an increased presence in college life. Where she wants to see women's and gender studies a few decades from now is a question she is conflicted about. So in a utopian or ideal world, these classes would disappear because they would be somehow braided into general curriculum. You know, but if I were to say that in, in among some of my colleagues, they would very rightfully say that's so dangerous, that even the idea is dangerous because when that happens, inevitably women are going to disappear again, that we need the marked category. So that's, where do, I, where do I want to see women's studies go as a field? I'm conflicted on it. Because um, just even, te yeah, even compartmentalizing it off as a separate category of study, I think it, it serves that sort of duplicitous function of empowering the students in that classroom. But I think it also reaffirms somehow the notion that their experience as women is different from the human subject experience. I hope that we get an amazing crew of majors who want to change the world, and I hope that they do and go out into New York City and make a difference. We already have some students who are interning with the New York City Alliance for Sexual Assault. They're all so driven. For Study with the Best, I'm Viano Ravinka. The battle over responding to sexual harassment charges is consuming national headlines, and yet not much is known about the legal underpinnings of what makes sexual harassment against the law. Ari Goldberg reports. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And that says it all. That is the Title IX law in full, one sentence, as read by Bernice Sandler, the godmother of Title IX. For a long time, if people even knew about Title IX, they knew it most often for its impact creating more equality in school sports opportunities. But that one sentence has had profound effects on the entire school system, many in the news now. So Title IX was a simple law that initially was, was applied to athletics, but increasingly was used to raise up questions about sexual harassment, sexual violence, sexual abuse on campus. If there is discrimination, as sexual violence would be, if there's discrimination based on gender that interferes with living and learning, then it would be a Title IX case. And the Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education would be the place to hear those complaints. The OCR under Catherine Lehman at, um, in the Obama administration took violence against women extremely seriously and developed what was called the Dear Colleague Letter, um, in which case universities were really on call for taking sexual violence and sexual abuse and sexual harassment much more seriously. Sexual harassment has always been prevalent, on campus or otherwise. Some have been surprised at the sheer amount of stories coming out recently, but they've always been there when listened to. The Me Too movement is definitely just the tip of the iceberg and all these people coming out um, about having been sexually harassed or assaulted in some way. I know that I didn't talk about my sexual harassment, and so how many other women have not come forward to be a part of the movement or even to just to talk to anyone about it? But some in the current administration think the Dear Colleague letter swung the pendulum too far. The era of rule by letter is over. 
Through intimidation and coercion, the failed system has clearly pu pushed schools to overreach. Proponents of DeVos's approach say that the Office of Civil Rights, the OCR, ended up overcorrecting the issue under Obama to the point that innocent men could be presumed guilty without due process and that the process was now overly criminalized. And to be sure, there are indeed cases of false accusations, and certainly colleges have complied with Title IX at times by often finding it easier to send a difficult situation off to lawyers and criminal courts rather than mediate. The problem, though, is once rolled back, there's nothing concrete that's been offered in its place. Undoubtedly, there are cases where justice was not served on either side. I wish we could have a, um, a serious look at the stories of women that have been brought forward that have been silenced, the stories of men who feel unfairly um, prosecuted. We have flipped from not taking this seriously at all, which was when I started, to taking it seriously for like five minutes under the Obama administration to language that Betsy DeVos herself has used, saying those were kangaroo courts, these men's lives had been ruined. If, in fact, there were an interest in saying, how would we do this better? How would we really secure um, the, the, the rights of victims and the rights of those who were accused? If that were the palette of options, I'd be really interested in that conversation, not just rolling back. Rolling back is a, um, a weak response, um, not a proactive federal response. At the end of the day, these aren't faceless policy wins and losses. There are real people's lives affected. In regards to my own sexual harassment, um, there have been simple cases of like a grasp, a grab on the subway, someone blatantly grabbing my butt <laughs> or, or swiping across my chest, but it was so obvious. Those and those kinds of things happen pretty typically. Um, more serious things have happened in my life, things that I don't want to divulge, but um, they were life changing, like uh, very life changing. I had to change career, I had to make decisions that I didn't want to do um, based on the fact that when I did, when I did bring up what happened to me to the uppers, they wouldn't do anything about it. It's always hard to parse the politics from the person. And with an often palpable mutual distrust on both sides of the political spectrum, it's easy to be for or against policies just by virtue of who's the messenger. So what's to be done? One possibility is something called restorative justice. I do know that CUNY has been a leader in advocating restorative justice practices and teaching people how to, how to engage in restorative justice. The communities, perpetrators and victims come together and have serious conversations about responsibility, remorse, and giving back. We need a different process that, that, holds, that holds men accountable, that holds women accountable for abuse of power. Once you criminalize, the, the bright lights of guilt and innocence are very stark. And in these cases, it's often complex. Um, that's not a reason not to hold people accountable. But for me, it is a reason to build educational settings, therapeutic settings, restorative settings where people could talk through the complexity of it. Complexities that deserve everyone's attention. I hope that people take sexual harassment more seriously so that we can all feel more comfortable to actually talk about it and make people accountable. For Study with the Best, I'm Ari Goldberg. Coming up next, a female graffiti artist and Baruch College grad who's breaking boundaries in her field. Mariev Amy has that story. The work of Indy 184, graffiti artist, fashion designer, and entrepreneur can be seen in the streets or in galleries around the world. Best known for her bright and colorful pieces featuring classic American film stars, Indy is among the few female street artists to gain recognition in a traditionally male-dominated art world. What are the messages that you want people to take out from your work? I see it like they're pages of, of my diary and it's like self-empowerment messages mixed with like strong female imagery. So it has a lot to do with like my childhood, being that I grew up with, um, you know, I was raised by a single mom and that I'm a child of an immigrant. So self-empowerment and female empowerment are like the main themes.
tell us about your style and who are these women? The, the female icons, they're the spirit of my work, the, the soul. They represent beauty, strength. I have used um, Hedy Lamarr a lot. She was an Austrian actress and also an inventor, and she was supposedly the mother of Wi-Fi. So to me, that's like, you aren't just a pretty face. There's just so many different levels to females and their legacy, if you will. The style is mixed media. So I basically mix photography, graphic design, and I also used to do stenciling. So it's like graffiti, all of that stuff. They're party, and it's an explosion of colors and energy. I took a women's histories class taught by Professor Julie Desjardins. One of the main strong messages that I took away from that class was, you know, I was confused, you know, I was painting graffiti, I was using a lot of pinks and doing hearts and, you know, doing all this girly stuff. And then I'd see other artists and I also want to do like more like hardcore, darker things and more masculine things. But I, I just, I was confused and my professor, she said, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Whatever you choose to do is the right way. And that was just everything to me. There's no right or wrong way. You want to be grungy, you want to be emo, you want to be pop. It's all good. What was it like to be a female street artist at the time? I didn't even see it like as, as a gender thing. I just did it because I wanted to do it. It worked towards my advantage in a way. Because there were like fewer girls, so to be like more eyes on me, I don't know. It's a double-edged sword, honestly, because it was like, oh, but you you don't do this because you're a girl. Oh, but you do that because you're a girl. Tell us about the fashion design. How did that come about and what's right. the work that you're doing? I love fashion and I was always drawing as a kid. So I started my own streetwear brand called Queens Destroy. And I set up my own shop. I, I did everything, production, design. I hired interns and, and hired other freelance artists, but everything was myself. Recently, I got commissioned by this Italian company called iBlues, and they commissioned me to do a whole capsule collection, which is coming out next spring. And they, they took my mixed media style, so it's kind of licensing my artwork. So that's pretty exciting. This is my first, you know, full clothing collection coming out next spring. And this is one of them that you're wearing? Yes, I'm wearing one of the shirts, one of the shirts from the collection. If you want to learn more about Indy 184, check out her website at www.indy184.com. I'm Maria Vemi for Study With The Best. Up next, let's take a look at a film class at Brooklyn College that explores the power of filmmaking. I'm currently teaching a class called Media Activism because of the crisis in which we live. Allowing young people to know that there have been histories of people engaged in struggle against oppressors is the first step. Modeling for my students that there are other great uses of this medium besides making narrative films simply by manifesting a commitment to radical expression and radical change. I think I do a service to my students and that they have as much right and responsibility to this as anybody. If you don't like it, we have that power. Why would someone say that a camera does violence? You can misportray someone. Yeah, why is that violence? Isn't that just, I don't know, language? It's violence because uh, it might be the only impression that uh, the public has of a certain type of person. Dehumanization is a violent project. Why does it feel violent when you're misrepresented? Well, following the um, 2016 election, there was a spike in uh, hate crimes towards okay. minorities. So okay. one would wonder whether it was the images being portrayed in the media regarding the so there's a direct relationship between dehumanizing people and then the things that follow. <coughs> direct. Most of my students are first generation college students. Many of them are immigrants to the United States. This is the great mission of CUNY and it's really quite real here at Brooklyn College. These are people who have been denied access to all kinds of things because of their race and class and nationality. 
And the idea that you can embolden people to think that they have a voice, that in community their voice matters, making art, making propaganda, making documentary, making, you know, whatever they're making, um, you know, is a, is a, is a long-cherished vision of um, radical filmmakers and feminist filmmakers. How we think about how we make film and how we frame the thinking about how filming is made produces different films. And Laura Mulvey begins to ask us to think about the gaze as patriarchal. The gaze is looking in cinema, and her theory is going to explain why that is both produced by a sexist or patriarchal environment and how it perpetuates it. Are we in a patriarchy? Yes. Yes, okay, we live in a patriarchy. The United States of America is a patriarchy. It means that I live in a system that is ruled by men, and then I try and be my best self and change it. But we currently live in a patriarchy most clearly defined by our president and his, and, you know, his acts, and just as another example, the rash of uh, the way that the film industry is organized by patriarchal power, which has been displayed to us very evidently and grossly in the sexualized aggression towards women, which organizes the industry and always has. And this has been revealed under the Trump administration with the firing of Weinstein, Louis C.K., Kevin Spacey, etc. Some of my students are feminists and doing feminist work. Some of them are environmentalists and doing environmental work. You know, I don't know that it needs to be feminist subject matter to be feminist in relationship to process. And for me, that's about acknowledging, acknowledging that everyone has a voice, that things happen powerfully within communal settings, that um, we can make things that are outside of corporate imperatives that matter to us, that matter to where we're from and where we are. These I see as feminist values for filmmaking. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.